Glad that you are here this morning. Happy Memorial Day weekend. You excited about that? A couple of you are. Okay. All right. The rest of you, you might want to make some cookout plans or something like that with some friends. But I, I love Memorial Day. I love the opportunity for us to acknowledge those who have given their lives so that we can enjoy the freedom that we have in this country. Uh, but it also, for me, it, it begins to stir my affections for the one who gave his life so that I might have eternal life. And, uh, and I hope that even as you celebrate over the weekend and you remember those who gave their lives, that you will also take a moment and just thank your Heavenly Father that in His plan, in His infinite plan, His eternal plan, that He sent Jesus to give His life for us. And so, I, but I do hope that you enjoy, enjoy the weekend. And uh, we're going to jump in. We're in this series on Elijah. And Elijah is this guy in the Old Testament. He's, he's got some crazy things that, that went on actually in his life and in his ministry. And today we're actually going to address um, one of my favorite, favorite stories in the scriptures. And just um, 1 Kings 18 is where we are if you want to turn there. But uh, we have to start by talking about something that's very, very personal uh, to all of us in the room. So very, very personal from this perspective of, listen, you, you've got some things going on in your life that I'm not sure you realize. And, and what it is, is, is it's called an idol. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever asked that question of like, what is an idol? But we all have these things that we struggle with in our life. And those things become idols in different seasons. So in different seasons of our life, when you're younger, you might have uh, an idol that is different than if you're in your, you know, the middle stage of your life. And then as you get towards the end of your life, and I know we don't want to talk about the end of your life and all those kinds of things, but it, there's these things that become idols to so many of us. And the problem that many of us have in our life is that we don't really acknowledge them. We, we don't really get to this place in our life where we want to come face to face with um, those things that are idols. But you have to ask the question of what is an idol? And as you answer the question of what is an idol, then you probably have the opportunity to then look in to your own heart and into your own life and go, okay, these are the things that I am struggling with. John Piper uh, put together a definition of an idol, and it looks something like this. It says this, an idol is the thing loved, think about that, the thing loved or the person loved more than God. That seems like a pretty good summary, doesn't it? And I know, I know, you're probably sitting there and you're going, yeah, but I love God a lot. And I, and I do too. And, and I think most of us in this room are going to say, that. in fact, one of the things that I find in a lot of people's lives is this is how we talk a lot of times. We go, you know what, I love God so much. You know, when I ask people questions in terms of, you know, when you die, to, if you were to die today, or those who might even be facing death, you know, how do you know for certain that you're going to go to heaven? And they'll go, well, I love God. That's, that's a lot of times, I bet that's the majority of the answer that I get in it. So you might look at the definition of an idol and you're going, yeah, but I love God. But, but the question is, these things become idols to us when um, we love them more than God, a thing, or even, this is the difficult one, a person that we love more than God. But it goes even a little bit deeper than that. Not just loved more than God, it's actually wanted more than God. Think about it. Those things or those people who are wanted more than God, who are desired more than God. Now, are you starting to begin to look at some things in your own life? So, loved more than God, wanted more than God, desired more than God, treasured more than God, and then this last one, in, in the way that Piper says it, is enjoyed more than God. And so, the question becomes in your life, and the question becomes in my life, is um, what are those things in my heart, what are those things in my heart that I love, that I want, that I desire, that I treasure, that I enjoy more than God. And so one of the things we're going to see today is the fact that the Elijah, as he's on Mount Carmel, is going to actually build an altar. He's going to repair an altar. And he takes 12 stones, uh, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And, and I wondered this morning, just as we walk through this, to try to make it personal for a lot of us in the room, and that makes it a little bit challenging, but I wondered if we could begin to identify some of the idols that we have in our own hearts. So think about it in terms of this. Um, if, if maybe, let's say, this becomes an idol. That's the first one, sex. That was the last one in the last service, but sex becomes an idol. And, and truly, like this might be in those early, you know, earlier, you know, you're in your late teens, early 20s, even through your 30s. And this becomes one of those things that's so motivating for you that this is what you're chasing in your life. This is the sole thing 
that's important. And it may not just be sex. It might have to do with even lust or pornography or any of those types of things that have really gotten a hold on your, in your life and in your heart, and it becomes an idol to you. Maybe the second one might be your kids. And, uh, and you might start thinking about your kids in terms of, man, I've got kids and they are an idol to me and those things that I want and desire are for them. Um, and you think it's all great and wonderful, but the truth of it is when you trace through history, and especially the generations that we currently have, it seems like every generation is trying to set themselves up in a manner that says, hey, I want my kids to have things that I didn't have when I was growing up. And, and not only that, but then our kids are becoming idols to us in the way that we want them to be involved in anything and everything, right? And so you're, as a family, and this is going to hurt some of you, and I'm sorry for this, but um, some of you are running here, there, and everywhere every night of the week because you want your kid to be involved in everything. Well, guess what? There's something going on in your heart that you might need to deal with because let me just tell you, maybe you don't know this, that's not a super healthy way to live as a family, And I don't know if you've discovered that and you're tired and you're frustrated and your kids are all of those types of things. And maybe you need to evaluate those things that are truly more important. Because remember, an idol is something that's loved, wanted, desired, treasured, or enjoyed more than God. The next one in your life might simply be social media. And some of you don't want to admit that, but you spend your days and your nights actually scrolling through Facebook. And honestly, it, you're comparing your life to those other people that are posting things on social media, which, by the way, they're only posting the very best stuff. I don't know if you've realized that, because you're probably only posting the very best stuff in your life as well. And occasionally, we might put on there something difficult that happened to us. But you see, one of the things that's challenging for us in this area of social media is it, it will then drive who we're becoming, because we're trying to keep up with the people that we view on social media, and it becomes... Uh, a God. And I don't know, maybe, maybe some of you do this, but have you ever just gotten on social media and then like an hour, hour and a half later, you're like, man, where in the world did my time go? It went down the drain really is what happened. But anyway, next one, this is a tough one. The American dream. Some of you think about the American dream. You're going, man, this has become a God to me, this idol. Like I want, I want the American dream. I want to pursue the American dream. I want all of these things. I want opportunities and I want to build a business and I want to build this and build that and build the other thing. And so much so there, there's not anything inherently wrong with something like this, but, but when it becomes the thing loved, wanted, desired, treasured, and enjoyed more than God, then it becomes an idol for us. And then how about maybe your friends have become an idol to you and you don't want to necessarily acknowledge it, but your whole life, maybe, maybe you're so consumed with who your friends are that you want to be in the right circle with the right people, or you're just super consumed with what your friends might think about you. And that becomes just the motivation for how you might live your life or how you might go about the things that you're going about in your life. And then you've got, how about this one? This is a tough one isn't it? I mean, I love the country that we live in. I do. I love it. But our country is not to be worshipped. Our country is not to be, to be put on this pedestal as this, the, the best country in all of history and blood, all of those things. No, no, no. Because see, what happens is that becomes an idol. And what are you going to do? And I'm just throwing this out there. I'm not saying it's going to happen. But what are you going to do if it's not there? <laughs> Some of you have never thought about that. Or what are you going to do when certain freedoms and rights might be taken away from you? And it's like, uh uh-oh, does the whole thing fall apart? Does your whole faith fall apart? And this is one of those areas for me. And even when we think about something like celebrating Memorial Day and the 4th of July is just about six weeks away and those types of things, and they're great opportunities for us to celebrate our country. But we should not be more excited about our country than we are about the God that we serve. And some people that I know, and you know some people as well, that the USA, the United States of America, is something that they love, want, desire, treasure, and enjoy more than God. Or if we go to the next, the next stack, and what do we got here? We got, maybe you, maybe you have problems with cars. Some of you, I was driving the other day, I, I, I my, found myself behind a Ferrari. Now, why you own a Ferrari in Bluffton, I'm not sure. And if that's you, I'm really sorry about that. But um, I'm not trying to offend. But one of the things that I realized is I'm driving behind this Ferrari, um, and I realize this. I, I, I thank God sometimes, and this is one of those, that I'm a, very, I'm a large person. 
uh, because I would never fit in a Ferrari or like a Corvette or some sports cars like that. So I don't really have this, this envy or covetousness that some people might have anymore because I can't fit in a lot of those things. Now, there's other nicer cars, maybe larger cars that are, that are there for me, but those things sometimes become our pursuit. Or how about this one? This one was a tough one. You maybe can't see that, but let's just throw this out there. Sports. Let me just, I want everybody to see this for just a minute, okay? Because there were, there were people in the first service that really thought we should just put this aside. Now, it, it's really easy for us to say, well, we can put it aside because why? Because, well, it's baseball season. And I know some of you might be huge baseball fans. I'm not a huge baseball fan. But you know what's coming? Football. <laughs> oh, the same response. And, and here's the thing. And it, it, our life during football season, our schedules are dictated by the game schedule. And I wonder, I wonder just a little bit how, how much sports really are an idol for some people. Not just professional sports or college sports, but maybe it's your kids' sports. Like you think little Johnny is the best baseball or football or soccer player that ever walked the planet. And can I just tell you that little Johnny is not the best at anything that he walks the planet. I mean, I don't mean to break the news to you about little Johnny, but maybe somebody should tell you. So let me be the one to tell you that little Johnny, um, he's probably not going to be a professional athlete. I mean, he's probably not going to be, I mean, I know, and they all get trophies and we, uh, but they become idols in our life. And that's hard for a lot of people to hear and for us to acknowledge, but it's something that really we've got to come face to face with and begin to go, you know what, what am I going to do with that? Or maybe this next one is self. And nobody wants to, nobody really wants to admit it, but you know, a lot of us are just living life for ourselves. How do things impact me and how am I affected? Or uh, maybe we're just consumed with how we, how we look or how we come across to other people and things like that, and we become our own idol. Or this one which says, maybe it's a house. Maybe there's a house out there that you would call your dream house, and it's become just an idol to you, and, and God's trying to dig away at it, and you're like, no, I you're not going to touch the house. You're not going to touch the house. In fact, your house might even be a museum where things actually can't, people can't come and live there. They just have to come and sit in one spot for fear that they might break something in your house. And if that's you, I'm sorry, please don't invite us over, because my, my family my family, my kids will ruin your house, period. They just do that. They tear things up. And, uh, or maybe it's money, you know, your pursuit of money, the thing you love, you want, you treasure, you enjoy more than God might just simply be money or, or it's the pursuit of your life that you would have more and more and more. And maybe, I don't know if you've realized this, but you get to the end of all of these things and maybe this last one, they just throw it up there so everybody can see it, but it's just clothes um, and some of you, that's not necessarily that big of a deal, but for some of you, uh, you might be one of those people that has a whole bunch of clothes in your closet. And a lot of those clothes still have price tags on them because you've never worn them. Um, and that's just the pursuit of everything that you, uh, you have in your life. Can I, and I just, in true confession form, um, I have a problem with shoes. Um, I love a good pair of shoes and I love, I have a lot of different pairs of shoes. And so it's one of the things my wife sort of makes fun of me about. And every time I buy a new pair, I have to get rid of a pair. And so if any of you wear a size 12 and you want some shoes, let me know when I'm getting rid of my next pair, I'll, I'll consider it for you. But those are all the things that we struggle with in our life, right? Those are the things that we have going on and they're idols and they begin to take root. And they're the things that we're pursuing more than we're pursuing God. And so the question becomes, what are you willing to do about it? Are you willing to make a change? Are you willing to come face to face with something like one of these things? And this isn't an exhaustive list. Listen, I'm not smart enough to come up with the exhaustive list of idols, but um, you might want to add something to it. I had one guy in the first service. He's like, man, I'm, I'm adding some things to it. And then I'm also tracing how my life in different seasons of my life I'm going through. Like this was my problem. Then this is my problem. This is my problem. This is my problem. Those types of things. But the truth of it is these things are empty pursuits. They don't feel like it at the time. At the time that we're going through them in the season of life that you might find yourself in, they feel like the most important thing to you. Building your business might be the most important thing to you. Having enough money might be the most important thing to you. Your kids might be the most important thing to you. And yeah, your sports team might be the most important thing to you. But guess what? Your sports team's going to go through a season where they're terrible. 
And your kids are going to go through a season where they're terrible. And you're probably going to go through a season where you don't have the money that you wish you could have. And you're not going to live in the house that you want to live in. And you're not going to drive the car that you want to drive in. And you're not going to have the circle of friends that you might necessarily want to have as your circle of friends. And you're not going to wear the clothes that you want. All of those things. You're going to go through seasons of life. And you're going to find yourself at the end of it all that those things are empty pursuits. In fact, the psalmist, this appears a couple times in the book of Psalms, he actually addresses idols. Now he's talking about the actual physical idol that somebody might, be, might create. But in Psalm 115, he says this about their idols. He says their idols are merely things of silver and gold shaped by human hands. They're, they're just things. They're shaped by human hands. So a human made them. He says this, they have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes. Think about it. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. And they have feet, but they cannot walk. They have throats, but they cannot make a sound. And those, listen, this is, this is us right here in this room, and those who make idols are just like them. And all who trust in them And see, one of the things that you realize in the Old Testament, if you've traced the Old Testament at all, is throughout the Old Testament, the nation of Israel really struggled with setting these little gods up as the God that they would worship. Sometimes it would intertwine with their worship of Yahweh. Sometimes it'd be, well, we're going to worship the God that led us out of Egypt and all that. But we're going to add to it this God and this God or this God and that God. That's how sometimes they did it. And some of you do the same thing, like, well, I love God, but I also love this, 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 and this, and the other thing. And, And the question becomes, when are you going to get to the place where you're willing to say, I worship God and God alone? Because that's actually what happens in 1 Kings 18. If you have your uh, copy of the scriptures or your tablet or your phone or whatever, just open to 1 Kings 18. And we're going to pick up in verse 21. So let me give you a little context for just a moment, a little context of where we are. Uh, And so Elijah had appeared to King Ahab um, uh, that we talked about last week. And with King Ahab, he told him that there's not going to be rain for three years. And so for those, that time, Elijah was hidden in some different places and those types of things. And uh, King Ahab actually kept trying to find Elijah because he wanted to find a solution to this problem of not having any rain in the land. The famine became very severe. severe. We looked last week, in, in fact, where the brook where Elijah was, it actually dried up. So then he went to this widow's house and all of those types of things are going on. And the king keeps looking for Elijah because he wants to find a solution to this. He wants to know really what it was, was he probably wanted to know what's the formula for us to get out of this problem. Tell me what we need to do, we'll do it, and everything will be okay with us. But uh, he couldn't find Elijah. In fact, so much so that there's a guy named Obadiah. Have you ever heard of Obadiah? There's actually a book of the Bible named Obadiah, and he's a prophet. But he's a prophet a little bit different than Elijah because Obadiah is actually serving in King Ahab's court. And so he's He's a follower of God. He's a follower of Yahweh, uh, but he also served in Ahab's court. But however, he actually tells us in chapter 18, if you were to read through it, there were different times where Elijah would hide some of God's prophets so they wouldn't be found by Ahab and Jezebel. And so um, Obadiah was doing those things and Elijah was kind of doing his thing. Uh, And at different times, the king would send Obadiah out to try to find Elijah. That's a lot of tracking of those names, okay? Ahab, Obadiah, Elijah. Ahab is king, and he would send Obadiah out in different times and different seasons to go look for Elijah. But in this particular instance, in chapter 18, Ahab is trying to find a pasture that his horses and his cattle can actually graze in because there's famine in the land, but he wants to take care of his own things. And so he sets out, in one direction, and Obadiah sets out in another direction to try to find a pasture where the king's um, cattle and the king's horses can then graze, okay? And as Obadiah goes out, he goes out in another direction of King Ahab, but off in a distance, so I don't know how far this was, but off in a distance, he sees someone and he knows that that's Elijah. And he had been sent at different times to try to find Elijah, and so he goes up and he goes, Elijah, what's going on? And Elijah says, because he had heard from the Lord, Elijah had heard from the Lord to say, listen, Elijah, I want you to go see King Ahab. So Elijah appears in front of Obadiah and he says, I need you to get me in the presence of King Ahab. And Obadiah, get this, this is really good. Obadiah looks at him, this is my paraphrase by the way, but Obadiah looks at him and he says, are you crazy? 
are you, are you ser- seriously, Elijah, you want me to get you in the presence of King Ahab? Do you not realize that we have been looking for you for years? Ever since that you pronounced that there was not going to be rain in the land and that drought set in and that famine set in, we have been looking for you. He has sent me out multiple times to try to find you. And each time I come back empty handed and he thinks I'm lying to him. And I know you, Elijah, Obadiah, this is again my paraphrase, but I know you, Elijah, and you want me to go and you want me to request that you can have a presence with King Ahab. And then I bet that the spirit is going to carry you away somewhere else and I'm never going to find you again. And then what do you think King Ahab's going to do to me? There's no way that I'm doing this. And Elijah just looks at me and says, no, I promise I'm coming. I need to appear, but the Lord told me I needed to appear before King Ahab. And so Elijah finds his way and he stands and he has an audience with the king again. And as he has an audience with the king, the king looks at him and says, man, Elijah, you are a troublemaker. And Elijah looks at the king and says, I'm not the troublemaker, king. You are. You're the one who has led the people astray. You're the troublemaker. And then it says this, the king had assembled all the people on Mount Carmel. And in 1 Kings 18, verse 21 is where we're going to pick up, if you will. He says this, Elijah stood in front of them and said, how much longer will you waver? I'm sorry, Elijah stood in front of them and said, how much longer will you waver? Hobbling between two opinions. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people were completely silent. So I want you to think about this for just a minute. I want you to think. So Elijah gets it. He gets in front of the king and then the king assembles basically all of Israel around there. So everybody's standing around and they're talking. And Elijah looks at everybody in, in the same way that, that God is looking at us today. He says, this is, this is what you have to choose today. Look, if all of these things or if one of these things is God, then you should worship that thing and you should follow that thing. If you have found that this, this, or one of those 12 things, or maybe you've added something else to the list, I don't know, for, for the nation of Israel at this time, it was Baal. And Elijah just given that opportunity. He says, look, if, if Baal is God, then you should follow him. But if God is God, then you should follow him. And the people sat there and they were silent. The people who knew God, the people who knew of Yahweh, the people where it had been handed down from generation to generation, all the things that God had done for the nation of Israel. And they were just silent. So Elijah has an idea. And I don't know that this idea came from the Lord. I have no idea. It just, it was one of those things. He says, all right, let's have basically a showdown. He says, why don't you get two bulls and, and the prophets of Baal can have one. They could choose whichever one they want and they can build an altar. And then I'll build an altar and I'll take whatever bull that they don't want. And, uh, and so we'll just set up these two altars and we'll both call down fire from heaven. We'll both pray to our God. We'll call down fire from heaven and, uh, and whichever God responds and brings down fire from heaven, he is God. Does that work? And everybody's like, agreed. This works. So this is the plan. They just go, they begin to pursue that. So the, the prophets of Baal, they select their, their, uh, their bull, and I'm sure they tried to pick the finest one, and they, they build their altar, and they begin calling out uh, to Baal. And so verse 25 or 26, if you get there, it says this. Uh, so they prepared one of the bulls and placed it on the altar. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning until new time, shouting, O oh, Baal, answer us! For there was no reply of any kind. Then they danced hobbling around the altar that they had made. I think it'd be funny to see all of us do that. Um, I'm convinced that there's not many of us in the room that can actually dance, okay? Can I get, I don't know, some of you might. But basically, this was, this was part of how they pursued um, their worship of Baal. So they did these crazy things, and this is what they did. They kept calling out to, to Baal. They kept calling, oh, Baal. And they would, they would wail, and they would get louder, and then they would, they would dance around the altar. And then it says this, that it was about noontime, so this had been going on for, for for, for several hours and about noontime Elijah began mocking them I love the way that he mocks them he says this that you should just shout louder you should shout louder surely surely he is uh, he is a god perhaps I love how he says this perhaps he is daydreaming perhaps he's daydreaming or the, the next way that he says it or perhaps um, he is relieving himself and that just basically means he's in the bathroom so maybe, maybe he's daydreaming or perhaps Baal is out using the bathroom or maybe he is away on a trip or maybe he is asleep and he needs to be awakened. So you should just shout louder. And here's what's funny. So Elijah's just, he's just making fun of him. And he's just making fun of him. So what do they do? They actually listen to him. Verse 28 says, it says this. So 
they shouted louder and they followed more of their normal custom. They cut themselves with knives and swords until the blood gushed out of them. Doesn't that seem like a great sight? It's like, so we're going to shout louder, we're going to dance more, and now we're going to take knives and we're going to begin to cut ourselves so that the blood is flowing out of our veins. Is that the kind of God that you would like to worship? I don't think so. But listen to what happens. He says this. They raved all afternoon until the time of the evening sacrifice. And here's, here's to me what is so interesting. There was no sound... There was no reply, and there was no response. Why? Well, because although idols have ears, they cannot hear. And although idols have mouths, they cannot speak. And although they have eyes, they cannot see, and ears, and they cannot hear, and feet, and they cannot walk. And so as the prophets of Baal and all those who were in attendance that day found out, there was no sound, there was no reply, and there was no response. And I wonder today if you can identify one of the gods that maybe you've been worshiping, that you've loved, treasured, enjoyed more than the God who sent his one and only son for you. Have you found that that God responds with no response, with no sound, and is just silent? Have you found that at the end of that pursuit, maybe there's a car, a house, a business, whatever it is that you have, or your kids' sports, or your favorite sports team, and they no longer win championships and do those kinds of things, or maybe they do win the championship, but then what? Then what? You get to the end of it, and you find that it's just empty. And that's what was happening with the nation of Israel and the prophets of Baal. They get to the end of it, and there's nothing. So Elijah, he calls the people over. He kind of had enough at this point. I guess this had maybe carried on for about eight hours, six or eight hours, something like that. And he says, come over. And so they crowded in around him. And he repaired. He took an altar. There's an old altar of the Lord that had been torn down. And he took 12 stones each representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Now think about it. 12 tribes of Israel. I told you last week, maybe you remember, maybe you don't. The nation is divided at this point. So the nation of Israel, which is where Elijah is, they have 10 tribes. And then there's two tribes that are in the nation of Judah. But as he repairs the altar, he's reminding people that they're one. They're one. And they should only be worshiping one God. And so he repairs this altar, and I don't know what this looked like, but each stone represented the 12 tribes of Israel. And, you know, so maybe Elijah takes that moment, and maybe he starts calling out the, the different tribes. And, and so Reuben, and Dan, and Asher, and Gad, and Issachar, and Ephraim, Manasseh, Judah, Benjamin, Simeon, Zebulun, and Naphtali. And I don't know, maybe, I don't know what that looked like, but, I mean, he's got 12 stones. It says he represented the 12 tribes of Israel, so maybe he's setting those things out, and he's calling out to remind the people of how faithful God is. And then um, he goes on, and he, he gets to this place where now it's just going to be really, really simple. He's going to utter, he's going to utter this prayer. Um, but he does one thing first, which is interesting. As he prepares the altar and he puts the, the bowl on it, he has the people go and get water. And they pour it over the altar. He says, now do it again. They do it again. He says, do it again. And they do it a third time. They build an altar and they had a trench that they had dug around the altar. And so it's soaking wet. The trench is filled with water. And it's just, to, it's really to prove a point when you think about it. Because if you're going to call down fire from heaven and that's all wet, I don't know if you've realized this, but it's pretty hard to like that kind of stuff. So Elijah gets to this place, and he's got that all set up. And so he, he says this in, in 1 Kings 18, picking up in kind of the middle of verse 36. He has this prayer now. He says, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Reminding the people, think about it, he's reminding the people of the God that they serve. Abraham, you remember Abraham? Oh, Abraham. You remember Isaac? Yeah, I remember Isaac. Isaac's the one that Abraham, he had taken him up on the mountain and he was going to sacrifice him on the altar. I remember that. 
Remember Jacob? Oh, Jacob, he's the father of all these tribes. I, I remember. You begin to remember who God is. You remember God's faithfulness. And it begins to stir something in people's hearts. And it should do the same for you and me in our life as we get to this place where we start remembering. It's like, oh, yeah, that's the God that we serve. We remember how empty and fleeting all of these other things that you are. And so Elijah prays and he says, Oh Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. Oh Lord, answer me, answer me so these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you have brought them, and I love the way he says this, that you have brought them back to yourself. Did, did you ever think about the fact that that's what God wants for you as well? That even though, even though for a season that you may have given your life to one of these things, he's going, no, 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 I, I want you to come back to me. I want you to come back and worship me. I want you to come back to relationship with me. I want you to come back to know me. I want you to come back to enjoy me. I want you to come back and treasure me. Just like he did with the nation of Israel at this point. I want you to come back. And immediately, this is what's so cool. This is one of the things I love. Immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. Yes! I love that. I, one of the things I love about it is just the description that, that they give. And I don't know who's writing this, but they're writing it. And it's, it's not just that it consumed the sacrifice. It consumed the sacrifice, whatever wood was made to build the altar. And I don't know if you realize this, but I believe it's pretty hard for stone to be consumed by fire. But that fire was so intense that it consumed the stones and licked up all the water in the ditch. So much so that probably all that sat there was just this big thing of black. I don't know. <laughs> but that's the kind of God that I want to serve. I don't, I don't want to say, you don't want to serve a God that doesn't respond. You don't want to serve a God that you're going to call out to for six or eight hours and you're going to cut yourself and let your blood flow and they're not going to answer. That's not the kind of God that any of us want to serve. We want to serve the God that's going to respond and bring down fire from heaven. That's the kind of God we want to serve. And this is what happens. And when all the people saw it, when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and cried out, The Lord, He is God. Yes, the Lord is God. Then Elijah commanded, Seize all the prophets of Baal. Don't let a single one escape. Which, by the way, probably not all that hard when you think about the fact that they had just cut themselves and let all the blood flow out. Just throwing that... Just an observation that I've made from the scriptures, just that's free for you. Um, so the people seized them all. Elijah took them down to the Kishon Valley and he killed them all there so that they could not lead the people astray again. I love this. I love this story. But the thing that I'm realizing in my own heart is that I have a problem. And I bet that you have the same problem. That at different times and different seasons, there's an idol that begins to surface. There's something that you begin to worship. There's something that you begin to enjoy. Maybe adore a little bit more than God himself. And the question becomes, what are, what are you going to do to What are you going to do about that? Um, this, this piece in, in Exodus 20, you might want to jot this address down, but um, I was just reading through this, and, and we know the Ten Commandments for the most part. I mean, if I were to sit you guys all down, I think you could come up with a good many of them. But in Exodus 20, listen to what um, Moses hears, right? So the Ten Commandments comes down, and you know, you know it's like, the, um, you must not have any other God before me, okay? Okay, and we're like, yeah, I know that one. But then he says this, you must not make for yourself any idol or any kind or any image, anything in the heavens or the earth under the sea. You must not doubt, bow down and worship them um, for I, the Lord, am your God, and I am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. Did you know that? See, you, you, you're probably like me, and you know some of the Ten Commandments. And so you're thinking, yeah, I know, I know the Ten Commandments. You don't have any other gods before me. You don't make for yourself any graven images. You don't bow down before them. You know, honor the Sabbath. You know, be nice to your parents or obey your parents. However they go, you're going to start listing them out. But listen to what he says as this goes on, because it gets better in this. He says... Um, 
I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, and I will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. And, and listen, I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. And I know you're probably sitting there and you're going, well, that's not fair. doesn't matter. He's God, you're not. Maybe you forgot that. She says, I'm, I'm going to pass this down, third or fourth generations, for those who are going to reject me. But listen to what he says for those who don't. It's even better. Verse 6, But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. So I know you thought that it wasn't fair that he would pass down to third or fourth generations, but for those who love him, for those who follow him, he's going, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pour out, get that, I'm going to lavish. Not, not a little bit. I'm going to lavish my unfailing love to a thousand generations for those who will love me and follow me. You see, but, but the nation of Israel, they struggled with that. They struggle with that. They get to this place where they're, they're not following the Lord completely. They continually get, led, continually get led astray. And they're about to enter the promised land. And I don't know if you know how this unfolds, but you know they had to wander around for 40 years because they complained and grumbled against the Lord and all of that kind of stuff. So they wander around for 40 years and they're just on the edge of entering into this land that God had promised. Like, this is going to be your land and it's going to be this land flowing with milk and honey and I'm going to give it to you. Because of their disobedience, they didn't get to enter the land. But they're about to. This next generation is about to. Which which means what? What are you going to say to the next generation is they're about to enter the land? Right? So so I don't know how old you are, but like with my kids, I've got 15, 13 year olds, I got a 10 year old, and I got um, two nine year olds. So what what are you going to say to them? And you might have kids that are older than that. So what are you what are you going to say? What do you want to pass down? Because I, I mean, I'm reading Exodus 20, I'm going, man, I want them to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, because that's how Jesus summarized that first part of the Ten Commandments. Because I want it passed down from a th- for a thousand generations. And Moses looks out among the people in Deuteronomy chapter 30. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 17, he says this, If your heart turns away and you refuse to listen, which that's some people that we know, If you are drawn away to serve and worship other gods, much like these that we have up here, then I warn you now that you will certainly be destroyed. You'll find that they're empty. They can do nothing for you. You will not live a long, good life in the land you're crossing the Jordan to occupy. And he says this, today I give you, I give you a choice between life and death, between blessing and curses. Now, he says, I call on heaven and earth as a witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. That's, that's you. That's you and that's your, your kids and that's your grandkids. That you would choose life, that you would choose life. And he says this, this is where I want to get. Verse 20, you can make this choice, he says, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying him, and committing yourself firmly to him. This is the key to your life. Hmm. How about you? Pretty simple. You can do this. You're making this choice. You can do this by committing, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying Him, and committing yourself firmly to Him. You see, the problem that a lot of us have is that we're pursuing these things and these things. And God's still looking at us and he's going, I I have everything that you need. I, I have everything that you could hope for. I have everything that you could ask for. Come on. The key to your life, choose life. Moses, choose life, choose death. This is how you choose life. Love him, obey him, and give your life over to him. Love him, obey him, and give your life over to him. Let him become the pursuit of your heart. 
and do away with these idols that we have that really are empty, fleeting, and momentary. And when we will choose to love him, obey him, and give give ourselves to him, this is the key to your life. So what are you going to do? It's a choice, really. We're all, we're all at a crossroads at different seasons, wherever you might find yourself. You're going to live your life for something, or you're going to live your life for someone. You might live your life for one of these things, one of these pursuits. You know, ah, I want to be famous. I want to do this. I want to have money. I want to have this house and this neighborhood and drive this car. You're going to live your life for something. You might just live your life for yourself. But how about thinking about it this way? How about you stop living your life for what you created? Your job, your house, something that can be created. And maybe it's time for you to start living your life for the one who created you, who has a purpose and a plan for your life, who invites you on a mission with him, who will fulfill you in ways you never thought possible. But you see, it's got to start by us beginning to address these things that have a foothold in our hearts. And it's hard for us to acknowledge these things. We joke about the sports one in particular and maybe the cars and we laugh and all those kinds of things. But the truth of it is, I I bet that for most of us in this room, there's, there's one of these things that has begun to take a hold of our heart. And today's the day that you need to address it and you need to deal with it and you need to make a choice so that you can find life and it's found in the presence of your Heavenly Father. And the way that you get there is through Jesus. Love Him, obey Him, and give yourself to Him because I promise you He has great things in store for you. I'm going to ask you to stand as we close our service. I want you to know that we're going to sing this song and our prayer team is going to come down front. And they're here to pray with you and for you and over you. But I also want you to know that this is available for you just to come and pray because I just believe this is one of those weighty messages that, that just is heavy for us. But we need to hear it because we need to deal with these things that have begun to take hold of our hearts. And so I hope that you'll allow God to move in, in some way, in some form, in some fashion in your life. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to hear your word. Lord, I thank you that you care enough and and you want us back. That's that's what you say all throughout scriptures. You want us to come back. You want us to return. You want us to to find joy in life and fulfillment in your presence. Like you're never looking at us going, you know what? I'm done with you. And God, I thank you for that. I thank you that you care enough to allow us to see these things that have really taken a hold of our heart. And I ask that you would help us to, Lord, just identify them. That we would repent and turn away from them. And Lord, that we would find hope in your presence. And for it's in Jesus' beautiful, matchless name we pray. Amen.